And we are live. Hi, Carol. This is Fantastic Fiction at KGB. Hi, Good to, hi <laughs> Amy. Hello, everybody. So lovely to see everybody. Back oh, you got a big again. locust check, huh? Back virtual Amy, again. Amy got a huge locust check. What's that? Amy, Amy got a huge she locust got, She's electronically depositing her locust check. Oh. <laughs> hi, Amy. Hi, Teal. James Glenn. Hi, Carol. Hi, everyone that's joining us. Back virtually again tonight's oh, guest. Look who's behind you, Sarah Sarah you know and Sarah Pinsker. And her child. <laughs> and, her, and her. You have familiar. two now, right? You have one of her. I do. I do. They're on either side of me. And oh, making noise. That's why I muted myself. Well, Hopefully you they'll know, they'll everybody's again a second. So it's, it's all good. They started barking the second Matt said. Uh, and we're live, like literally this <laughs> that second. So. I, I just make doorbell that. sounds. Yeah. Right? Uh, That's yeah. how that goes. Yeah. So I just found out Body Shocks was nominated for a Splatter Punk Award. Oh, congratulations. Which is like shocking. I mean, I am not exactly known as a Splatter Punk. I think Brian Keane was shocked too. He emailed me to confirm, I forget what, something last night. Um, and he said he was surprised and very happy. You know, so hi Kate. Which it, but it's so weird. <laughs> Congratulations. Hi Kate. hi Kate. And you see Daryl Gregory was nominated for a, um an Edgar. Oh, that's awesome. For yeah. his novella. That is a fun, fun novella. I haven't read it. Is it horror? No, it's a mystery. It's I, can't a, read it. I don't have time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wanted to read it. Well, mention Dr. Moroz. Oh, he read from it. It was really it sounded really funny. I'd like to read it. Well, maybe in the time between when I take a break from the year's best. Oh, yeah, he read that at KGB. Yeah, he did. It was great. But it's yeah. not hard. It's like, I don't have time. Hey, was that, that was the first month back. It was him and Mike DeLuca. Oh, that's and right. We were in person, and we were like, yes, we're back now. Thank you. Oh, but and then fucking Omicron. Yeah. You know. But. We'll see. Glad we have virtual. Right, because now we can have people watch us from anywhere. We tried to do the, uh, I tried to record it live, you know, the in-person events and- It didn't work. Yeah, it's just too many logistical issues. Cause like, you know, being like co-hosting it and filming it and yeah, worrying well, about like, is the camera position right? Is the angle right? Or am I catching people <sighs> you know, mm -hmm. private conversations in the background. It, yeah. yeah. It's wasn't, wasn't ideal, but. Uh, Are you drinking stout? I am. Good eye. Yes. I'm drinking um, Bourbon County Cherrywood stout. It's actually good. really good. Yeah. Mm. It's um, one of my, this brand, um, Goose Island, mm -hmm. they, um, they make some of my favorite uh, stouts. If you ever get a chance to try their, all of their Bourbon County stouts are amazing. And uh, they usually sell them in Whole Foods. And if you, uh, if you catch them on a sale, you can get them for like under 10 bucks, which is a steal. Cause these things like a, a, a stout this good is usually like, you know, 15, $20, sometimes more. And for a bottle? Really? Yeah. For good stouts. Yeah. Wow. This is good stuff. I got to, Pace myself though it's fifteen percent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Really letting your hair down. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, this is nothing for me. But that's uh, that's been my problem through the whole pandemic has just been that uh, I can't drink an entire like one of the like nice stouts at the you know the big bottles that are the size of wine. Like I can't drink those on my own. It's half of what I have here, um, most of what I have here, and I like they're meant to be shared. I feel like and and I. Yeah. And the zoo doesn't drink stout, so so there's no no one to share it with, and so I I just have more and more of them accumulating. Um, and and I we'll have to have a stout. I'm just aging them, is what I'm saying. I'm a, I'm aging the stouts. Mm -hmm. Aging is good. I think there's a peak year. We need to ask uh, Scott Andrews about this, but I think stouts peak after about three years. I'm not sure about that. I think it has to do with the sugar content in them. And what happens after they go they bad? Just, they get less tasty. Oh. Uh, I mean, <laughs> there's a there's a moment where they taste like like some kind of like almost a almost a wine like a 
I have had, wine I've had yeah. waters that tasted like wine. That yeah. Were yeah. Have that sort of like sweet port like taste. Some yeah. of them, yeah. I think yeah. some of them taste like licorice. Um, yeah. yeah. A lot of them have coffee in them. And I, I like, oh, I like that. A lot, the chocolate, chocolate stout is some nice. Of them have a lot of coffee in them. So it's like you drink a few at night and you're like, it's 3 a.m. Why am I not asleep? You know? But, uh, yeah, no, this one has no mm. coffee. It's aged in bourbon barrels mm. and then cherry wood barrels. So oh, nice. I wish I could share, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> maybe in the future we'll, we'll be able to share over, you know. I actually was able to drink, I drank some single malt last week with um, yeah. Emily and John. And I, I, what I did, I took a Pepsid and I was able to drink about that much and it didn't make me sick. I also had ginger right after. I made myself drink, have some ginger. Yes, ginger is really good. I, if you ever seem to be do okay. I was considering I might consider having. At our break, I may drink some of my vodka. My, uh, you know, my buffalo, my bison grass vodka. But I have to take the Pepsi first. Mm. So maybe when I, Tochi is reading, I will run and get some vodka. <laughs> I get my Pepsi rather first. So, <laughs> <laughs> I'm right. I'm both drinking and wearing a kind of variation on a on a gold rush, so it's basically a cold toddy. But um, so what's what's in it? Uh, it's it's honey and um, honey and lemon and uh, I used uh, a, a maple whiskey uh, mm -hmm. instead of regular whiskey, so it, it is basically a, a toddy. Which yeah. kind of which kind of maple whiskey? Say again. Which kind of maple whiskey? Don't worry about the dog. Uh, okay. Dog if you can't is. hear them too well, then they'll they'll be quiet again soon. Um, it is. Uh, it's it's French Canadian, and I'm blanking on the. Uh, we we buy it every time we're we're in Toronto, and I am blanking on the brand right this second, but I can have it for you in a, at the break. Uh, the reason I ask is because my friend Kristen Jans, who is from Canada, um, has shared. Her maple whiskey with us at cons and i'm wondering if it's the same brand but i don't remember the name either so. uh i could tell you in one second but i yeah. am yeah totally blank or i can look it up probably but yes hi gene rossner gene rossner says i hope it's okay if i put this up here i understand preferring live but being expatriate in boston i'm grateful for the virtual shows we're grateful to have you gene uh we're, we're grateful you know that people can join us from all over the world you know uh, this, you know, it's a nice thing about living to, to, to uh, get off to, he's working right now. He, you know, he's from the Philippines. I said, and maybe you can drop by during a break <laughs> and come and peek. Who's that? Charles Tan? Charles Tan. Yeah. The brand is Sortilege. Oh, oh okay. which I don't, that doesn't ring a bell, but yeah. Fine. Happy to attend from LA. Yes. Kate joining us from LA. So... Hi, Gabe. This is probably our farthest viewer was Australia, I guess. What's like the furthest from South the, Africa? Oh, South no, Africa. Not the, no, well, that, no, no, they read. No, but Australia is, yeah. Australia um, is I don't remember where our farthest viewer was. Yeah. Uh, we had some, we had guests. I mean, Australia is a horrible time. I mean, it's like the middle yeah. of the night. A middle of the, isn't it? Right. They were waking up. 14 and hours later. It's not, it's, it's, not, it's not a bad time for Australia. No, for England, it's really bad for the continent and and England. Well, yeah. it's 14 hours ahead, so it's the middle of the day. And Usman Malik, what wasn't it, like 2 a.m. for him Pakistan. or 3 a.m.? Yeah, Pakistan. <coughs> oh, Frederick, you're in the Catskills? I didn't know that. Hello from the Catskills. What part of the Catskills, Frederick? I, I know the area fairly well. Um, if you're just joining us, uh, this is Fantastic Fiction at KGB I with Toshi Onyabuchi and Sarah Pinsker. Uh, back virtual again. Very awesome. excited for tonight's readers. Hello, Teresa. Hello, neighbor. Teresa's, Teresa's my neighbor. She lives upstairs. Literally. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I no, I'm not kidding. You. We, we live in the same building. Um, hi, Lisanne. Curious about what storage meant, so I looked it up. The practice of foretelling the future from a car. I'll put this up on the screen. So mm -hmm. 
Uh, curious about what sortilege meant. So I looked it up. The practice of foretelling the future from a card or other item drawn at random from a collection. Oh, okay. I thought sortilege was witchcraft. It's not. I guess it's not. I mean, it seems kind of witchcraft. Yeah, they, they seem like they yeah. might be connected. I, I mean, don't know where I got the idea. Sortilege is kind of tarot cards, right? Um, yeah, I guess. Or, I, I think, or, or Uno cards. <laughs> <laughs> right, Uno. Or, so, or that's good. Uh, what do you call the cards with the four uh, that they have to guess uh, with the four different symbols? Is oh, the, the psychic cards? Yeah. The waves. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't remember what they're called. Zener? No. Magic. Yeah, yeah, that's what it is. The, Zener cards? Yeah. They were, those were in, uh, um, uh, man, I'm having a night. Um, this is what I get for drinking. Um, but, but, uh, <laughs> uh, they were in the the Spoonbenders, the other Daryl Gregory mm -hmm. book. Mm -hmm. oh, he used them. Oh, okay, here it does say something about sorcery. I, I had a, a, a in French. It does say here. Oh wait, it says witchcraft, sorcery, wizardry, magic. Oh, sort of lege. Okay, no, with an accent. Lege. I don't know. There, there is an accent on the on the bottle, if that helps. Okay, well here it says it means witchcraft, sorcery, wizardry, magic, witchery, necronomist. Necromancy, blah blah blah. So that's it interesting. whiskey very well. Hmm. Never sink river in my backyard, ten miles from the Never Sink Reservoir in Claryville. I don't know where that is, Frederick. I, I, it sounds beautiful. <laughs> I like the Never I Sink River in my backyard. I never heard of draw four. <laughs> that's, 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 that's Uno. Uno. Yeah. What's Uno? I think uh, this is oh, a, game. 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 a card game. Oh, yeah, I never that has it. started many must awards. Be after my time, they <laughs> just they just announced that they're doing a deck that's all wild cards, which seems a little chaotic. It's so chaotic. To me. It's yeah. so chaotic. It's like if you want to oh, break up a family chaos. and like a loving family, you you <laughs> get that deck. It's just nothing but chaos and bedlam. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. So we'll, maybe why don't we do another five minutes or so? Yeah. We can wait a couple minutes for people to stroll in, as they say. Um, yeah, so I'll just throw this up here. Um, we're, you know, What's Milbourne? Oh, Milbourne. It's a thousand miles. It's a, it's a French game where you have to get like a thousand miles. I haven't played that since I was a kid. I was never really heard of that one either. I never heard of these games. You know? I think they were they were very popular in the in the early '80s. Some of these, like Uno and Milbourne. Oh. Um, I played yeah. Hearts. Hearts. Go well, they, like Uno and Milbourne had special decks. Oh. Yeah. Um, if you if you feel inclined, you can support the series. Uh, there's a link on screen, or it's in the YouTube description. Uh, we are, um, you know, viewer audience supported. And uh, if you can click the like button and the subscribe button on YouTube, just to help us get a, some more views. And, you know, we want to uh, promote our authors tonight. And, and also, of course, uh, not just tonight, but uh, for, you know, we've done this, this is, I think the 19th month or so, 20th month that we've done like it. Forever. Yeah, it feels like an eternity. It's so nice to be in person for two months. <laughs> We should have known it would never last. I mean, yeah, the, obviously the readings have been great. The, the pandemic sucked, but the, the readings have been awesome. Mm. Um, I've actually really liked, um, I mean, I don't want it to go on forever, obviously. I like being in person too, but I've liked the glimpses into people's homes. Like mm -hmm. at the at the National Book Festival where they, they they do the thing where there's a recorded reading and then and then they do a live Q&A. And Walter Mosley was there last year, and it and instead of like he was in his art studio, and so people started asking questions about the art behind him, and he pulled out a sketchbook and he starts showing like like paint like like just paintings and drawings and stuff, and that isn't what we would have gotten if he was on stage. Like like yeah. you know the conversation would have gone a whole different way, but because mm -hmm. we were where we were, um, you know we got this glimpse that we would never have gotten otherwise, and I thought that was really cool. So yeah, I, I've been hearing that um, cons are probably going to do, you know, like writing conventions are probably going to do like a hybrid model going forward where they're going to be like in person. But if you can't make it, they'll have some kind of virtual hookup on the screen, maybe a projector for people who can't 
be there in person. And um, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. I mean, I, I love cons being in person, but, uh, you know, that there are people that can't make it for whatever reason, um, numerous reasons. And just being able to, you know, participate that way, I think, is pretty, pretty good. Carol, I like that that you're uh, assuming that that uh, <laughs> I, I'm not sure if you're assuming the piles are gone now <laughs> or or what. I Cap think she's uh, assuming they're hidden. <laughs> I'm going to repeat this for people who are listening to the podcast, which is audio only. Uh, Carol Geisender comments: Remember at the beginning of the pandemic when online hosts had had a tidy background until they moved the camera and showed all the piles. <laughs> yeah. We, we live in kind of a, what they call like a shotgun apartment or a railroad. So like if if I wanted to show you the, our bookshelves, I would have to sit like facing like in this corner facing the wall. It's just, yeah. So uh, I like some of the fake backgrounds in Zoom. Yeah. If you create your own, I think they're fun. But I, use, I, think I, I can't use, figure out how to do it anymore. They left, they got rid of the app, I think. I use the, the different views of the room uh, with my students to show like the, that you're different ways of telling a story that, that you can sort of change the color of the story you're, you're, you're telling just by, mm -hmm. um, you know, a change of angle. So, so right yeah, now I want to tell you the story emotional. about my bookshelves, but um, if I turned it a little <laughs> bit, you would see my, my uh, like Wonder Woman uh, dolls and, and my narwhals and, and all of the other, and the dogs and all the other chaos. Nice. Um, you're watching Fantastic Fiction at KGB. We're back online uh, virtually again. Um, tonight's guests are Tochi Anyabuchi and Sarah Pinsker. Uh, we're super excited to have both of them reading for us tonight. Um, I think we should get started. What do you think, yeah, Alan? Let's do it. Yep. All right. All right. So uh, Tochi's going to be reading first. Um, just... Really quick, I, actually, I'll let Ellen do the upcoming readers. Um, okay. All right, I'll, so, I'll have to. Yeah, yeah, we do, yeah, yeah. We'll do it. You want to do it? Let's do it, let's do it at the break. Um, you want to now? Go for it. I, it doesn't all matter. Right. I'm sorry, I'm doing it now. It's too go late. Go for it. <laughs> all right, February 16th is virtual, and we're having N.K. Jemison and Brooke Bolander. We're not sure about, well, we don't know whether we're going to still be doing virtual in March or in person, but we'll see. But upcoming readers in the next few months, assuming that we're in person, <clears throat> are Victor Laval in April and Robert Wexler, Grady Hendricks and Alex Irvine in May, Sam Miller. Oh, we had planned Sam Miller already. Anyway, Sam Miller and Karen Euler in June. And in July, Daniel Brown and Greg Frost, Gregory Frost. So, you know, at this point, after February, we're planning on in person, but who knows what's going to happen. So. Yeah, so uh, um, the, the KGB, fan, the Fantastic Fiction and KGB series, um, you know, we're, we're supported by our audience, um, our, and we give the the readers um, a stipend. When we were doing it in person, we we take them out. We would take them out to dinner. We would tip the bartender, and um, we also pay for the the streaming services and and other things. So um, if you can, if if you feel um, like you want to uh, help us out, the link's there. Um, if not, just click the, uh, the the like button or subscribe, and uh, we'd appreciate it. But uh, anyway, on to our, our first guest. Uh, Tochi Anyabuchi is a novelist and essayist who won the World Fantasy Award, the Ignite Award, and the New England Book Award for fiction for his novella, Riot Baby, a Nebula, Locus, and Hugo Award finalist. His works include the Beasts, Made of Night, and War Girls series, and the nonfiction book, Skinfolk. His most recent novel is Goliath from Tor.com Publishing. He lives in Connecticut. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for being here. And tonight I will be reading from Goliath. Uh, on sale January 25th, um, available for pre-order anywhere books are sold. Um, so I'll be reading a section 
a little ways into the book, but throughout the book, um, there are these uh, reported pieces that serve as inserts. And so I'll be reading uh, from one of the first of those. Uh, the title is Shadow Country, Life in a Post-Cataclysm Metropole. The complementary bottles of water are permanently chilled, and strawberry mint oxygen fills the lungs. The gas masks, arranged by size, had first appeared when Carlos, a former Latin king, before that an army engineer, had pressed a button on a remote, and a section of their bus's flank had opened. Small cumulus clouds of blue chill gasping out to reveal the rows of masks and their accompanying oxygen tanks. You hang back to pretend that you're cooler than the blonde-haired Scandinavians for whom this is their first hood tour, even though it's your first as well. You don't make any bones about whether or not your touchpad or stylist show because maybe they make you look like a professional journalist. But when you fit that mask to your face and take those first breaths, you feel safer too. No shame. You're way too happy that the thing actually works. You get sat next to a middle-aged man with two USB outlets behind his right ear and one fanny pack, and you have to crane your neck a little because the lady in front of you, the mother of some annoying kid on the bus, take your pick, refuses to tame the beehive that is her honeycomb pear. Fanny pack fiddles with his Rosetta, switching languages because he can't tell you're American. So first, he starts trying to tell you about his church back home in Finnish, then German, then French, then mistakenly Tagalog, before he gives up. You lean out over the aisle, and that's when you get a good look at Carlos. Buzz cut, bumblebee ink tattoo sleeves, all crucifix crucifixes and roses, and Dia de Muertos ca calaveras, and a nice neutral white tee over loose black jeans. Before you showed up at the station, a row of buses outside a warehouse-like building with the Icarus Project stenciled near the roof you made sure to do your research. What gang colors you should stay away from. You implanted in your pad a sheet showing every gang sign, a dizzying series of digital contortions, etc. Next to Carlos, half turned around in his seat is Jamal, dreadlocked so that he looks like a predator with his half mask on. His shirt is tighter and you wonder because it occurs to you with your worldly mindset if he's filled out his clothes with prison muscles. He waves at some of the kids while Carlos speaks, plays games with them, throws up a few fake signs and chuckles while they try to imitate. When they get bored, the kids tug on their parents' shirts and beg for snacks, mostly Pringles. Part of your research entailed looking into Carlos and Jamal and Devon, the stoic driver. Devon used to be a professional football player lasted all of a season and a half before a grand jury indictment for a friend's overdose brought him a prison sentence that drained his earnings and paralyzed his employment aspirations. He'd grown up in a gang here in New Haven, and it had followed him into the league, and now this was the only job for which his felony convictions weren't a problem. Through Jamal, he became involved in local community mediation, a group modeled off the interrupters in Chicago real line of fire activists playing Sisyphus with local gang violence. Devon's was a drug charge, the absurdity of the criminal justice system being such that his sentence was initially life, reduced for good behavior. He was 20 when he went in and got hired as Carlos's driver pretty soon after he had come out at the age of 39. Behind you, some white kid with a bandana tied in the style of the early 2000s across his forehead, not forward, murmurs in a conspiracy whisper to the astounded kid next to him. No more boom bap, this that click clack get back. Well, we don't listen to Bobby Thick, but when shit gets thick, they get to robbing you, peep. You look new here, and before them cats to the left be asking what you do here, stay close, open those two ears, and I'm going to hit you with this dictionary before you say the wrong things, and they pull them tools out and have you lay a missionary like the concrete is your boo. Here? He's local and has taken it upon himself to scare his poor neighbor shitless. Carlos is plugged into the bus's surround system. He flicks a switch by his jaw and speaks in his stewardess voice. 
Red is a very emotionally intense color. The engine revs, the bus warms with anticipation. It enhances human metabolism, increases respiration rates, and raises blood pressure. The kid behind you, to burn a Dutch is to float, to float is getting high, Fetty is gripping De Niro, get it, you getting by. Carlos the stewardess. It has very high visibility, which is why stop, light, stop signs, stop lights, and fire equipment are all painted that color. Red represents one fifth of Connecticut's gang population. Needless to say, dress properly when visiting the New Haven County area. Also, tuck your jewelry and keep your hands inside the vehicle at all times. Thank you. A half nervous, half bubbly chuckle ripples through the bus. It was all desolation to begin with. But when you get out the when you get out to the abandoned neighborhoods, to New Hallville, the places the upper middle class fled to get to the colonies, you see what the post-apocalypse looks like. The house facades are all gaunt, hollowed faces, out from which occasional black figures leech, ants out of a bleached skull. Where are all the street lamps? asks one of the blonde haired fins, face pressed against the window, stubby fingertips greasing it up. When the dome went up, certain neighborhoods were sectioned off, and the city took those lamps to build to help build materials for the launch station out in Fairfield. He doesn't sound like he's recounting an unfairness when he talks, but you know it for what it is. The city abandoned them. You're not sure what you were expecting, but it jars you to hear Carlos and Jamal talk in the past tense. Each corner turned reveals a new patch of gang territory. Here's where the R2 BWE black flags came up. That right there was one of their stash houses. Jamal is careful not to go too deep into detail as to how the drugs were made and sold. He has nothing to prove and it would breach the unspoken rules of the tour. These are visitors. We are visitors. The black flag, which they wore in their back pockets or had as bandanas or would wave around was meant to symbolize independence. Red and blue had long since been co-opted. The Latin King branches here had black and yellow. If you were going to beef with everybody, then what color was more appropriate than the one symbolizing an absolute void of color, of purpose, of affiliation? It's the color of self-immolation, of black kids with death wishes who don't have a convenient bridge to jump off of or a parent with a well-stocked medicine cabinet. Already you're romanticizing them. New Hallville is bordered on the north by the town of Hamden, on the east by Winchester Avenue, on the south by Munson Street, on the southwest by Crescent Street, and on the northwest by Fournier Street. Dixwell Avenue, Shelton Avenue, Winchester Avenue, and Bassett Street are the main drags cutting through the neighborhood. The Farmington Canal breaks straight through the middle. The late 19th and 20th centuries saw industry churn to life in the district. The canal gets converted into a railroad and enterprising George Newhall builds a small factory where the carriages get built. Other factories sprout like weeds around the first followed by workers' houses and a boarding house for the unmarried male workers. Guns come to Newhallville in 1870 when the Winchester Repeating Arms Company sets up shop. And by the Second World War, the thing covered more than six city blocks and employed over 19,000 workers. One family, two family, three family tenement homes surrounded the plant, built by real estate investors either for rental or to be sold on speculation. And when you have enough factory workers, enough breadwinners employed by a single industrial giant, you get butchers and grocers and barbers. Winchester becomes the leading employer in New Haven. So, of course, it relocates to Illinois. <clears throat> a machinist strike in the late 1970s results in the plant being sold to the U.S. Repeating Arms Company. And by the turn of the new millennium, the place had laid off the rest of its workers. Yale University tried to restore and redevelop the skeleton left by Winchester, turning the factory complex into Science Park. But space travel became too affordable too quickly. Satellite campuses in the colonies grew into main campuses, and parents had less incentive to send their children to a domed environment where, just on the other side of the shield, 
The air was so poisonous, your chances of lung cancer rose by an average of 35%. Tax base shrivels, resources dwindle, schools fail, and the kinds of things that keep kids off the streets, out of jail, summer programs, vocational education, church programs, all of that follows suit. Same story across the state. Same story across the country. The tax base left, but the guns didn't. The bus slows to a stop a few blocks from the cancered remains of the old Winchester factory, where the one family and two family houses now slump. Everyone fits their air masks to their face and descends from the bus after Carlos does a quick scan and makes sure the surrounding neighborhood is empty. Throws up a baby drone that relays the nearby heat signals and all is good because the drone, like a hawk, comes back down and folds itself to fit into the holster under his armpit. A bald, slim-bellied black guy in a sleeveless hoodie materializes at Devon's side, leaning next to the bus while Devon sits on the steps and several of the people who aren't taking pictures of the poverty porn crowd around. Do we really know it was real? Devon's friend, acquaintance, maybe gunman, talks like a chunk of concrete has been permanently lodged in the back of his throat. A guttural thing. And you wonder what he must have sounded like as a child. He's got veins casually sprouting like crow's feet from his eyes, and hanging from chains around his neck are obsolete smartphones, antique iPhones, and Blackberries ornament his chest. It's probably when we got shot at for the first time. Yeah, as far as me coming up. As we was hustling some shit, we probably shouldn't have been hustling. And you know how some guys, the older dudes in the hood, they didn't want us doing certain things. We was doing it on our own. We wasn't working for nobody. He leans against the bus with his legs spread apart, a posture of repose that's almost daring someone to come at him. You know, we was young, we had egos, we were like, fuck that, we ain't working for nobody. Then they had to give us some warning, so they actually came by and threw some shots at us. He starts chuckling. And we were like, whoa, this is real. If we're gonna be, if we're gonna be out here getting our own bread, we gotta tool up, we gotta be able to, you know, clap back. That's when we knew it was real. Have you ever been shot? Asks one mother. She's more curious than concerned. She's not asking someone who could have been her son. She's asking someone who could have been her store attendant or her carjacker. Yeah, I got shot. He sees a little toe-headed kid peeking out from behind the shelter of his mother's skirt, face completely covered by his air mask. Got shot right in the head, he says to the kid. I didn't even know I was shot. Motherfuckers had to tell me. His eyes don't move from the kids. I was sitting in the car, and I noticed an individual I had an issue with coming up at me. And I looked at my man in the car like, yo, some things transpired, shots fired. As I got out the car, and it was right there, corner of Munson and Winchester Avenue. With his thumb, he points back to the Winchester factory behind him right across the street from the factory. So I jumped in the back because I was sitting in the passenger seat. Got out the car and I ran across the street, you know. Dude ran away, turned a corner, killed off the block. And my mans, when he found me, was like, yo, you got blood on your face. And I'm thinking it's just from the glass. So I'm like, all right, yeah. So as I get in the ambulance, dude who came out the back, he took my hat off. And he's got his bot cleaning up my face, you know. Cop flies over to me, gets a good look, asks me what happened. I'm like, get out of here. Somebody threw a bottle. Cop's like, we heard shots. And I'm like, I ain't hear no shots over here. The little toe-headed boy has completely forgotten his mother. Somebody was driving by in a car and threw a bottle. The boy smiles when the storyteller smiles. There's glass in my face. I'm in the ambulance and dude's cleaning up my face and shit. And dude takes my head off to look to let the bot get at you know, get at the rest of my face, my head or whatever. Anyway, he's cleaning my shit and he notices there's a hole in my hat. So he looks at the hat, then he looks at me and he like, yo, a dramatic pause. He like, yo, yo, you all right? The crowd farts out a few barked laughs, but it's mostly sagging shoulders. I go, yeah, I'm all right. 
the guy says into the crowd. He go, yo, you got shot in your head. It's like shot in my head, you know. He's cheesing now too, looking back. <laughs> I don't feel nothing, but for a motherfucker to tell you you got shot in your head, you start thinking, you know, you start feeling something like, whoa. He minds losing his balance and a few people laugh. I'm like, I ain't shot in the head. Now I ain't got a brain case or nothing. And even if I did, niggas had muck rakers. Would have told my whole shit up. But dude showed me the hat, like, pole. And he showed me a little piece of the shell. And I'm like, oh, wait. And he's like, nah, don't touch it. And I chill out after a while because I had to get my shit right. Then I tell dude, yo, don't tell the cops. He like, all right, cool. I got you. I got you. Because at first he was like, yo, hey, yo, you could tell me. You was getting shot at, right? I said, nah, somebody rolled up by the car and he didn't even let me finish. He showed me the hat and he was like, nigga, that ain't no bottle. It was a young black dude, you know? So I'm like, yeah, there was a shooting, but yo, don't tell the police. I don't need to be dealing with all that extra bullshit. And he was like, nah, I got you. I got you. Cops come by on some what happened, who was shooting. Look at him like, one of y'all, motherfucker. It was a beat walker that took shots at me. Now he's the only one laughing. Shit bounced off my arm, too. I'm like Terminator or some shit. Nobody couldn't say nothing to me. No augments. All my shit is natural. Red blood. And I'm invincible. No iron lung. No brain case. None of that cyber shit in my arms. None of that. I was tooting my own horn after that. There's not too many niggas get to toot their own horn like that. You wait for the end because you know it's coming. He's telling the story for us, not for him. But if nothing can stop you, eventually it all stops trying. And you're the only one left. And you look around at the post-apocalypse and you see what he means. People linger to ask him some more questions, but you're already back on the bus. The door is open, but your mask is still on. And that's Goliath. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> that was great. That was intense. I loved it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so we usually take a uh, like a really short five minute break. Let everyone get a drink, go to the restroom mm -hmm. if you have to, and then uh, we'll be back in a couple minutes with uh, Sarah Pinsker. So uh, stick around for that. Oh, and I also want to say just um, you can get the author's books. You can get Tochi's. You can get Goliath. There's a link below at the bottom, and I'll, I'll also throw it up on the screen here. Yes. Uh, hang on one second. Here we go. little make use of the fancy, man, fancy little uh, Chiron there. Um, yeah, you can definitely, uh, definitely buy the book if you can. Um, and then uh, we'll be back in a couple minutes with uh, Sarah Pinsker, so stick around. <clears throat> I feel like there should be interstitial music.
Well, we'll wait. We'll wait the full five minutes for everyone to come back. But uh, just want to say I enjoyed that reading quite a it bit. Was great. Yeah. Um, it's not depressing at all. <laughs> I know. No, not at all. Not at all. Just you know, just you know, typical beach reading. No. <laughs> so this is bison grass vodka from Poland, which I'm going to drink. Is that the same one that we have at the KGB mm -hmm. bar? Mm -hmm. It's good stuff. Yes, it is. I took my Pepsi, so hopefully I'll be able to. You prepared uh, yourself. And also I have some ginger. Ginger case, on, on standby? Case, well, just it, in case. It soothes the stomach. Is it ginger chew or is it like the, the it's, sugar um, one? Sugar, it's well, ginger. Crystallized ginger. Okay, that's good. Love that stuff. Well, I have it around the house, so. Yeah. Has it, has it been five yet? <laughs> I don't think it's been five. It hasn't been quite five. Yeah. You know what the other thing the other thing that I like about I was thinking about what I like about the online readings also though is is also that I um it, I can send my students to them. Yeah. And I don't feel as bad about it as sending them to something like in person, like where mm -hmm. where it's going to take hours and hours out of their life, and I, I know they're busy, but but I like. Last uh, last year, I sent them to to mm -hmm. readings all over the place, and and they, um, and it's cool to have them exposed to to re like a lot of them were just flailing and grabbing or whatever I like suggested. It's like I like I gave your readings every month, and then um, a couple of the other series, and and but none of them had ever heard of any, and so they were all you know coming in completely cold, uh, which was well, that a lot of fun. Be good, you know. Yeah. So Carol says, my her friend Danielle makes the most amazing candy ginger, many flavors. Mm. That sounds good. <laughs> yes. You know what's really good is if you get real ginger ale, not the... You mean gin, like right? ginger beer kind of thing? Yeah, ginger beer with whiskey. Yeah, oh, that is really good. nice. Very good. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. I bet that would be, I bet ginger would actually be good in this drink too. Oh yeah, maple whiskey. Go that far. Yeah, maple whiskey, ginger, lemon. Mm. That would, yeah, that would be fantastic. There you go. I, I, have to, I have to say though, I have to say though, I can't downplay the municipal the the medicinal properties of Schweppes. <laughs> you know? What type of sweats? I mean, that's the brand. I Schweppes. mean, you know, just, just you water? know, the I green can. Tonic water. The green can, you know, that my yeah. all my mm -hmm. Nigerian aunties swear by it. <laughs> oh, really? You know, well, ginger you... ale. When I was having <laughs> felt sick to your stomach, my mom would always want you warm ginger ale. Yeah, ginger yeah. ale. I remember that. It's like when you were sick, ginger ale, of course. Ginger you know, ale. It was ginger like ale. artificially ginger flavored. Ale. There was no ginger in it. It was just high yeah. fructose corn syrup and artificial <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it, it did the trick, right? Yeah. I guess. Yeah. It didn't make better it afterwards. It must have been the sugar. Yeah. <laughs> or with a fizz. Who knows? Yeah. What it was. Well, a whiskey mac? It was the attention. Mm. It's called a whiskey mac in England. It was a staple where I was there. Oh, okay, cool. What is? I think whiskey? she means the ginger ale with whiskey. Yeah, ginger ale and whiskey. She'll let us know. Northern Neck ginger ale. Rest in peace. Uh oh, no, I never heard of it. Is that a brand of ginger ale? It sounds like a mu no longer around. Hmm. Ginger beer and whiskey. Ginger oh. beer and whiskey, oh. yeah. Okay. Whiskey oh. neck. All Ginger right. and cold brew. I don't well, that. I've had I've had the you know the the ginger chews the coffee ginger chews are good so I'm not I gonna have had coffee ginger chews yeah yeah the the company that makes all those different ginger chews makes mm -hmm. one that's coffee mm -hmm. and I kind of like that one it's coffee it, and ginger yeah together it sounds really strange I have to say I'd like to taste it but but I, if if that works then I'm gonna guess that the ginger soda with cold brew liqueur. Yeah, I mean, I like ginger work. chews, but they always eventually, I don't eat them fast enough. And they usually get hard like rocks, and I'm afraid I'll break my teeth on them. So Gene Rossner said that they pre-ordered Goliath. They already had Riot Baby, so there oh. you go. <laughs> cool. uh, Dark and Stormy is a really good, Amy. 
<laughs> yes, dark and stormy. Dark and stormies are great. Oh, and dark and stormies. Uh, dark and stormy ginger beer, rum, and lime. And there's also a bakery here oh. that does uh, dark and stormy cakes. It's like a pound cake, but it's got uh, ginger and and lime in the glaze. And it's, oh, that sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> there's um a drink in Barbados called um a corn and oil which is basically you know what falernum is it's basically a, a um, liqueur made from sugar cane it's super sweet kind of like triple sec and then uh that and one-to-one -one with uh with a really good rum and then a little dash of bitters and a, and a, and a lime that'll that'll do you right mm -hmm. <laughs> Can we start <laughs> sure <clears throat> welcome back everybody our second guest is Sarah Pinsker, who is a writer of novels and short stories and everything in between. She has won three nebulas, including Best Novel for A Song for a New Day in 2020 and Best Novelette for Two Truths and a Lie in 2021. Her most recent novel is We Are Satellites. She's, yes. <clears throat> She's also a musician with four albums to her name, including 2021's Something to Hold. She lives in Baltimore with her wife and two terriers, who you might have seen or will hear. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Please welcome Sarah Pinsker. Yeah, I'm gonna do my best. Hopefully, hopefully they're gonna stay quiet for a little while. The the adult one is asleep and the puppy is roaming around behind me crying. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna read to you from We Are Satellites. And uh, this is a book about one family and a um, a brain implant that becomes ubiquitous, um, and it, it it has one small thing that it does, and uh, everyone starts getting it. And I'm going to read to you from a later chapter. Uh, it's told through four four perspectives. So this is uh, the son in the family, and at this point he is an adult, um, and while uh, he has had a, a bad experience with the with the implant it's become clear from fairly fairly early on that he's um his isn't working quite the way others are i'm gonna take one more sip first no david did not want to go to a party he couldn't think of anything he wanted less than to go to a party it was a terrible idea sure he said in the return text when and where and then he was at Karina and Milo's apartment, standing on the landing outside their third floor walk up, standing on the edge of the city, standing outside a door that was the only barrier between him and more noise, more noise. It was already spilling out under the door and through the windows. Noise to add to his noise, noise on noise on noise. If it was locked and nobody heard him knock, he could walk away and say he'd tried to come and maybe Milo wouldn't point out that he could have texted to say he was there and opened the goddamn door. A car door slammed, voices on the stairs below him, a couple arriving at the landing where he still stood outside the door, both white appearing and tan in an outdoorsy way, not a tanning bed way, the girl with freckles under light makeup and a scab down one shin, the guy with the slight sunburn on his nose, and maybe they did those tough mud races together or played beach volleyball on a fake beach in some pickup league and that was how they'd met. Karina did those races and had been trying to get Milo to do them, but he said he'd had enough obstacle courses already for his life. Thank you very much. The girl looked more like she ought to be Karina's friend than the guy looked like he might be Milo's, which stood to reason since Karina had way more friends than Milo did. The guy carried two cases of cheap beer, one in each hand. The girl carried two bags of ice. One bag had leaked a trail of water up the stairs behind them. The guy nodded at the door. Locked? David shook his head and made an ineffectual gesture with his empty hands that nobody in the history of humanity had ever made. Seriously, how would it even translate, making that gesture at a guy with two cases of beer in his hands, when clearly the unspoken question was, can you take care of this problem? David turned the handle again, and the noise got louder. Pushed the door wide so the guy and girl could walk past him into the apartment. He needed another minute or two. David, you came! Milo threw his arms around David like he'd been stalking the door waiting for David to arrive. And David returned the hug. You think I'd miss this? Actually, yeah, I didn't think you'd come. Here, let me introduce you to people. It was mostly Karina's friends, as he'd guessed it would be, her party, her birthday, etc. Or anyway, the first few people Milo introduced him to were introduced with their connection to her, a work friend, a high school friend, someone from her obstacle race training group. 
They seemed nice enough and he memorized their names, their faces, took in their clothes, their drink choices, the way they positioned themselves. Like they didn't even care that their backs were to the windows, their backs were to the doors. They were shouting to be heard over other people, shouting to be heard over a song he'd hated in high school. They leaned in and shook his head, hand or nodded or clinked their beer bottles to his and said, nice to meet you. How do you know Milo? And he said they'd been friends forever. No lie, but didn't say they'd served together. Nobody needed to know that except almost every one of them said, oh, wait, you're that guy from the ad. The best me I can be. And then they sang an old Razor ad or they sang an old army recruitment jingle. And some asked if he and Milo served together. And no matter how he phrased it, they knew, they knew, they always knew. They asked stuff he didn't want to answer. He smiled and drained his drink and said he needed another, and made his escape. And all the time, his eyes were on the door, the window, the patterns of the crowd, the songs, the slight rattle and the bass notes from the speaker by the kitchen where he shoved his hands into the ice in the red cooler, looking for another beer, but also looking for the numbing cold for a moment, numbing cold to numb his brain too. Someone came into the kitchen while he had both arms elbow deep in the ice, and he knew it looked weird. Nobody looked for beer with two arms in the cooler. And the person said, you look familiar. And it was possible he knew her from high school, but he didn't want to be there while she figured it out and recited his commercial back at him. So he pulled a bottle out with each hand like he was going to bring one to someone in another room and raised them over his head like twin victories and icy water ran down his arms and into the arms of his shirt and over his chest, and it did not feel bad at all, but now it looked like it was sweat. And maybe some of it was, because there were so many people in this tiny apartment, and it was legit hot outside, even before you factor that in. The woman looked at him oddly, and he popped both caps and made his exit. There were more people in the narrow hallway with the picture frames on the walls showing Milo and Karina, and Milo and a beagle, and Karina and a cat, and Milo's family members whom David recognized, even if he hadn't seen Milo's brother in how many years, and Karina with her family that David didn't know. The hallway bathroom door was locked, but there was another off the bedroom, he was pretty sure. He didn't even need to piss, he needed two minutes alone. He expected the bedroom to be as loud as every other room. The door was closed and he debated knocking, wondering if he'd open it to find it in use like a high school party, some couple taking advantage of a bedroom away from the parents, the way most adults of their age didn't need to now, unless maybe they had just hooked up at the party, but he pushed the door open anyway and was surprised to discover an oasis. Two people sitting on the bed, sandals and wedges kicked off haphazardly, three others on the floor, two with backs against the dressers, one against the one bare wall. Four looked relaxed, the fifth on the floor with back to the wall looked more alert, like she was taking in everything, fingers tapping on thighs. Floor to ceiling windows, no, a sliding door, there was a narrow balcony beyond. He hadn't ever been in their bedroom before. It looked less than cozy, generic edge of city, beige carpeted, generic apartment. But maybe they'd cleaned it for guests, hidden everything that made it homey. Air conditioner pumping out through a vent in the wall, working on only this room far more successfully than in the rest of the apartment. Because of the door, he closed the door behind him, the closed door, blessed cool, blessed quiet. Nobody here was shouting, and the music was far away. Join us? One of the two people on the bed held out a small candy bowl. Two colors, yellow and teal, same size and shape. The yellow unmarked and the teal with the stylized lowercase q on them. Not candy, pills. Pills had never been his scene. He'd never really had a scene, but pills wasn't it. Nah, I'm okay, he said. If you're in here, you've got to play, said someone from the floor. It's a good game. What's the game, David asked, out of curiosity. He didn't buy if you're in here, you've got to play. In his experience, people offered drugs, and you took or you didn't, and nobody cared either way. Sort of a suit yourself, more for me attitude. And anyway, if they held the line, they couldn't force him, and he could walk out again into the noise. It was so much nicer in here. The person holding the bowl smiled. It was a friendly smile. They were cute. A floor sitter said, one pill makes you larger. But the cute one shook their head and dug a hand into the bowl, coming out with a yellow pill. This is Superman. It enhances the effects of your pilot. Hand back into the bowl for the teal pill, a perfect teal caplet against a smooth white palm. Too smooth to be the hands of one of Karina's tough mutter race buddies. And this is the Fortress of Solitude. Fortress of Solitude? He repeated it when they didn't explain further, though he thought he understood. It dampens the effect of your pilot, tamps it down, mild euphoria. The floor sitter said something again about one pill making you larger, like it was a reference to something. Oh yeah, Alice in Wonderland. Calm, smiling, Fortress of Solitude. 
He wasn't a drug person, never had a chance. He had gotten his pilot so early and everything he tried had just made it louder, louder. Who would have even thought that weed would make it louder, but it had, so there had never been a point he got paranoid and he was still on guard and he got stoned and he was still aware and he had tried one thing after another just once, just to see before he stopped bothering because it was always the same, so aware, amped, hyped, noise everywhere, same as always. If he was smart, he'd take a minute and look these up and see what they really were. If he was responsible and not five beers in and having a lousy night, even though he'd barely been there, how long, maybe an hour? He opened his hand, palm up. That's not how it works, said the cute one. He waited again, and this time they explained without his prompting. You close your eyes and you reach in. It chooses you, not the other way around. You swallow it without looking. Ride whichever wave hits you. That's why it's a game, said someone from the floor. There was a crash from the living room, then quiet, then a smattering of applause. David crossed to the bed, closed his eyes just for a second. He hated closing his eyes around strangers in a strange place, hated closing his eyes ever, really, when there was nobody on watch. But he closed his eyes. He heard everyone breathing. He heard the murmurs that were noise when the door was opened. He closed his eyes and put his hand in the bowl and took a pill, put it on his tongue and stuck his tongue out so they saw what he got, even if he didn't. It had a sweet coating. He swallowed. When he opened his eyes, the others in the room nodded approvingly. He put his beers on the nightstand and lowered himself to the floor next to the bed. Not the worst place in the room to be situated. He faced the door if anyone came through it. Anything that came through the window, at least the bed would be in the way. For whatever reason, nobody in this room asked his name or said they recognized him. And he took that as part of the experience, whatever the experience would be. He waited. Now that the novelty of his appearance had worn off, there were two conversations going in the room. The two on the bed chatting about a show he had never heard of, and the people against the dressers chatting about a mutual friend he didn't know. Only the alert person against the wall was silent, and she was closest to him. How long did it take? He thought that was the way to go, stay on the topic at hand. She shrugged, eyes wide. Fifteen minutes to start feeling it, usually. Half an hour for full effect. How far behind you am I? We're all at half an hour. He looked around. It wasn't that different from a room full of stone people when you were the sober one. You got Superman, he said, and they all got the other. She nodded. He tried to imagine an amped up version of the pilot, an even more aware awareness, molecules moving through space, dust through the air. He couldn't picture it. Friend of Milo or friend of Karina, David asked. Karina's big sister, she said, Alyssa. Oh, cool, he said. I didn't know she had a sister. I've been friends with Milo forever. Are you David? Yeah. He waited for the inevitable questions about the war or the commercial. Karina thinks you're great. He was completely surprised by that. Really, I always figured I'm the guy making Milo drink too much and dragging him away from her to sort out my problems. Nah, the way she sees it, you're a practical influence with a good job. Also, you have amazing curls. Her sentence ran on, but he had no problem following. Thanks. He ran a hand through his hair, still short, but already ignoring orders. I've always had a love-hate relationship with the curls. This is the first time in ages I've let it get this long. She looked like she was maybe going to reach out a hand to touch his hair, and she was cute and he would let her if she did, but he turned and straightened the two haphazard pairs of shoes that had been kicked off by the people on the bed to interrupt any move she might have made before it had a chance to happen. Karina's big sister. Cute, but a bad idea unless he checked with Karina and Milo first. If Karina actually liked him, he wanted to keep it that way, since he needed Milo. Milo was the closest thing to a person who understood him, who believed him about the noise. Do you want to step out on the balcony? I want to go outside. The balcony, in full view of the people in the room, seemed like a better plan than this intimate corner of the floor. Alyssa sprang to her feet like someone who thought she was moving like a cat. David followed, watching the others watch them go. The balcony was two feet wide, not big enough for furniture, just a couple of potted plants, one flowering, one green, neither of which he recognized. What was the point of a balcony this narrow? You couldn't sit, and the plexiglass barrier was too high for anyone not as tall as him to lean on. It was comfortable enough for him, but wouldn't you want a balcony where you could have a meal or sit and watch the sunset? But this was south-facing, he was pretty sure, so no sunset anyway. Outside, the music and conversation spilled from the apartment, but the sound was baffled, buffered, diffused, except for somebody shouting something, a joke, an anecdote, something endless above it all. There were sirens far off, but they didn't get closer. He had a feeling, an inevitability in his stomach, a knowledge this was a party where the cops were going to get called. Mixed race, mixed class, city, suburb, neighborhood, 
Same for the party, probably. The kind where the police knock politely and say everyone has to leave, not the kind where people end up arrested. But it could go either way, any night, always, depending on who came and what mood they were in and the response when they opened the door and what the neighbors had said. And of course, all of this was hypothetical. The air smelled like the flower he didn't recognize, drippy white and yellow blooms. What are you feeling? He asked me as he was curious, and she was clearly altered, and he still didn't know which way he was going. And this was all a terrible idea, but information would be good at this point. It's pretty cool. The barrier he, he leaned on at chest height was at her shoulders, so she lifted her forearms onto it and put her chin on her hands. Actually, describing it would be cool. I'll try. It's like even more input. Like that honeysuckle is overwhelming, heady, sweet, and I've never seen somebody pot honeysuckle before, but it looks healthy, so I guess it's working, and I wonder if it could grow big enough to sort of flow over the balcony's edge, and if that's allowed here. Karina said there are rules against everything in this complex, and I keep counting the cars in the parking lot, and I know exactly where everyone is in that bedroom, and they're all watching us, and Justin, the guy in the corner, keeps picking between his toes, which is disgusting in company, but he clearly doesn't care or doesn't think anyone is noticing, and Alex on the bed is looking at you like you're a snack, and they're trying to decide if I'm hitting you on you on or not. And I can pick out at least six different voices of people I know in the living room. And I can almost kind of follow all their conversations at once, but it's a little confusing. And there's a black cat slinking at the edge of the parking lot. And it's a rush, like a rush of information, a rush of stimulation. It's like I can follow all of it at once. And it would be overwhelming if I didn't also have this feeling of competence, like I can keep up. This is just me. Why are you staring at me? David knew he was staring, the same as he knew the heady sweet scent, and now he knew it was called honeysuckle, and he heard the conversations, even if he didn't know the people behind the voices, and the cat had already twice pounced on prey in the dark, mice or voles or something else small and fast and elusive. The cat did not succeed either time, but was already hunting again, and this was him, this was always him. This was a chance to ask without sounding stupid for once. He chose his words carefully. How much more... Information is it than you're used to? She cocked her head. A lot? I think it would be exhausting for any length of time. But like, what's it like normally? Normal. She gave him a look like he was asking weird questions, like people always did. As far as they were concerned, a pilot felt like a pilot, and there was no point in trying to describe that to others, particularly others who also had one. He tried again. I'm trying to get a sense of how different it is. Okay, you know how normally you... No, I can't put this into words. It's like there's that, and then there's this, and this is so much more than that. Hey, that cat caught something. They both watched the triumphant black shadow move against the black trees. Oh, how he wished she had said something else. He wished she'd put words to normal the way nobody ever did. Even now it rose in him, agitation, desperation, anger at everyone who said his pilot was normal, managed to make him feel like he was somehow abnormal without being willing to say as much. Yes, abnormal for his questions, but they couldn't fathom that his pilot might be different, that he might be different. No, they assumed he couldn't handle it, that the thing falling down, the thing failing was his cope, his competence, not the implant in his head. Surely nothing was wrong with that. Sometimes he wondered if other people had this problem. He'd wondered it so many times, but he didn't know where to find them or how to find them without calling more attention to himself. His sister said he worked for the devil, and he told her he needed to. Was that a betrayal? Did she know what it was like in his head? How could he explain why he was working for them anyway? How he was sure that it was him that was wrong, and not the pilots in general. Nobody ever said they felt like this, this mounting, surmounting mountain of stimuli. God, if Alyssa had said noise... He would have dropped to one knee and asked her to marry him just for the sheer relief of hearing someone else say it. As it was, disappointment settled over him like a wool blanket. Another itch, another shred of his attention fragmented off to scratch that itch, to present, to mourn a moment where he could have shared this with another person. Except it wasn't how she felt, not how she normally felt. The thing she was describing was the thing he felt every day, but it was a high for her, momentary, fleeting. He had forgotten to ask how long this drug lasted. And his stomach dropped at the thought. What if he had chosen the Superman pill instead? And what a name. Was the thing he normally felt a Superman feeling? Would it have amped his brain up even more? He tried to imagine it. Tried to imagine what it would be like to have even more stimulation. He would go crazy. He would be the person who clawed his own eyes out, who ran his head into a wall. Unless it was like the way stimulants work with ADHD. He'd seen brain diagrams. They somehow worked with the overcharged brain instead of making it explode. He checked the time, and it had only been 15 minutes. He still didn't know which pill he'd taken, 
but his heart was racing. Like he knew, he knew, he knew he had made a mistake. He was going to die. This was how he would die. Not an IED, not like the little boy, not a sniper, just his own brain exploding because he took a pill at a party. Kids, don't do drugs. What had he even been thinking? He watched Alyssa watch the world through his normal, everyday, hyper-aware, hyper-vigilant eyes. Fun for a little while, maybe. He didn't remember it being fun, ever. If she panicked, he could tell her all of his coping mechanisms, the things that worked on patrol to control it, the things that worked in the mall with his mother. As much as they worked at all, he was still a work in progress. Running, fighting, playing with language like it was a puzzle, a toy, a Rubik's Cube. He could tell her all those things if she asked, if she needed. She didn't look like she needed. She looked like she was enjoying herself. And this wasn't a comparison he would use out loud. He wasn't that dense. But she looked like a dog on a car ride with her head out the window. Eyes alert and darting everywhere, body tense. He watched her watching the world, watched with her, considered how rarely he could count something as a shared experience. He didn't seem to be ramping up. And then it happened. An unthing, an unclenching. Not a blanket he had to fight out from under, but a blanket wrapped around him, arms wrapped around him. The feeling behind the feeling of being told everything was going to be okay and believing it. Punctuation on a sentence that had been running so long in his head, he didn't even remember where it had started. Quiet. Cool. That was cool. I really enjoyed that. It reminded me of an edible experience I had. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was, that was really great. Um, so we usually at this point move to the, uh, the QA portion of the evening. So we ask that people who are watching live, if you have questions for tonight's readers, uh, put them in the live chat comments and we'll, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll try to get them answered. Um, I have a question for Sarah since you just finished. Um, yeah, so uh, this is a novel about a family and how they deal with a new technology. Why did you choose to tell it through the lens of this particular family? Um, I I like I, I love telling near future stuff and and looking for for those things that, that, that might, you know, that I would rather see us see not happen. Um, and I know that these are things that can be told like as a, like as a techno thriller or as a, you know, a mystery or a political thriller. Like there are all these ways you can go with something like this. Um, but, but I was just really curious what it would look like through, through the eyes of, a, a bunch of people who didn't have the whole story and, and didn't know what was going on and um, and and would have different experiences of it. So so David, it's clear from the very beginning is having um, a different experience than um, his one mom who who also gets it and and uh, and it works well for her, or uh, his other mom who refuses to get it and and watches as like society kind of blazes by her. Um, and and then the fourth member of the family is his sister who uh, can't get it because of uh, epilepsy. She she's uh, told she's not allowed to get it. Um, and and I just felt like I felt like I could get a, a complete story and a and a really interesting like on the ground view of it rather than rather than just you know the ra it wasn't going to be a cure story. Um, I, I just wanted to to do it as a as a family, uh, yeah, and see a few different sides of it. Yeah, I mean, it, it's almost like um, sort of taking the way social media exists today and extrapolating it, you know, 10, 20 years in the future or something, and seeing how it's like the same problems that we're having now with social media would be exacerbated by something that's like literally like part of you. Um, that was intense. Um, I like that my puppy showed up during it also, so that I had to read, read and scratch at the same got, time. You got some, some uh, multitasking some comments there that that was some very impressive multitasking. <laughs> uh, Tochi, we have a question for you. Goliath has been labeled as biblically inspired. Can you speak to some of the biblical allusions and our influences in the book? 
Uh, certainly. So, you know, the original kernel for the earliest incarnation of the story, it actually, you know, occurred to me in the summer of 2013. I was actually, I was actually in Ramallah in the West Bank at the time. And so I was thinking a lot about uh, the Old Testament and uh, the Israelites and the Philistines. And the question that I asked was, you know, what were the Philistines up to before, you know, the Israelites came and they started beefing? Um, and that got me thinking more generally about displacement and issues of gentrification and what have you. And so in, in the book, a lot of the naming of the characters is very intentional. You know, the title is Goliath. And, you know, we, we begin by following uh, these two characters, David and Jonathan. <laughs> so, so there's, you know, there's that element of it too, but also, you know, I wanted to, you know, I wanted to explore a lot of sort of Old Testament ideas of, you know, the the peoples, the characters who are sort of on the fringes of the traditional Old Testament narrative. You know, the people that are in the cities that get blown up. Um, you know, there's the, I, I think it was William Stone Coffin Jr. back in the, I want to say the 60s maybe, um, was on William F. Buckley's uh, talk show. And um, they were talking, I think, about like anti-war sentiment and protest and ways for the, the church to be relevant in that, the church as an institution. And William's Reverend, Reverend Coffin says something along the lines of, you know, they, they say there weren't any, you know, righteous men in, um, I believe it was Gomorrah. You know, there weren't any righteous men in Sodom and Gomorrah, but I have a very sneaky suspicion that there were ten righteous men. It's only their righteousness wasn't relevant. And I always thought that was so fascinating. Like, that was such a fascinating, quote, perspective. And that was something that I wanted to dive a little bit uh, into with regards to uh, this book. Yeah, you know, um, I don't know if anybody remembers. I wrote a novel called King of Shards, and and the the uh, the the myth there is about the Lam and Vav that there there were um, there's 36 just people in the world that sustain the world, and um, in tracing the origin of the myth, it comes to it goes back to Sodom and Gomorrah, and like you know, um, God says, "Can you find 10 just men in the city?" And then somehow 10 became 36 because. <laughs> 36 in Hebrew is, is, um, is, you know, it's, it's, uh, the certain number and it, you know, the letters represent numbers, et cetera. But anyway, it, yeah, it, it's pretty, that's pretty cool. Any questions from the audience? Questions from the audience. Another one for Sarah. So I know that you've been reading, you've been writing short work that's mostly dark, but that's a lot of, I mean, it's dark, but your novels are not actually horror. So how do you swing? How do you deal with that? And what may, oh, you got into more background. <laughs> Someone in the peanut gallery there. Um, when you, are you deliberately writing novels that are not horror? I mean, I'm curious as a mostly horror editor. <laughs> um, I think, I, I I think I, I can only do the really dark stuff for for short short bursts, um, and it, it's been hard lately though to do the, like my near future thing. Like like I, I've I've enjoyed writing these near future novels that that like deal with something on the dark side a little, you know, like like deal with things that can be problematic, but but find find uplifting ways to tell them. But but it's also been hard in the last few years to do that. So so I've been writing a lot of of dark or short fiction um, and and my new the novel I'm working on now is is still working on finding its voice um, but but yeah I, I've been enjoying having a, an outlet for the darker stuff and not um, the the given that the first novel basically came true and then, um, and then the second novel the the one I just read from um, like immediately Elon Musk started uh, you know, trying to get us to put things into our brains. Um, I, I, I feel like I, I need a break from, from, you know, things that are that close to us. I think it's hard to write near, near future in general right now. Um, just cause, you know, cause it's 
sort of fuzzy looking. And things are changing so quickly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Very, like very, very uncertain at the moment. Yeah. Uh, and there are always things that you think are going to go on and on and on, and then suddenly, pow, something changes everything, like the virus. But I was thinking of the Berlin Wall. We always thought it would last forever, and then suddenly it's like, well, it all fell apart. It's gone. Yeah. You know, so there's yeah. always something that, you know, coming out of left field that, changes everything with yeah you always run the risk i think with near future of, of being lapped by the present um and hopefully like if you're lucky it it doesn't happen till after the book is out right but, um, I, i've been i've been lucky on that several times now yeah, but. i mean william gibson had to rewrite um agency a few times i think as he was mm -hmm. writing it things kept changing politically and other ways I was very glad a song for a new day came out, you know, six months before everything started locking down. It just would have, it, I think it would have read differently otherwise to, to audiences. Cause people don't know like the, the length of time that publishing takes. Mm -hmm. right. So it would have looked like capitalizing rather than, yeah, good guesses. Yeah. Yeah, I just I, I I read the book Station Eleven, which is also about a pandemic. We're talking about your other novel, but uh, Station Eleven, and then we just finished the, the TV series, and and you know the first couple episodes when the when the virus is breaking out and everyone's kind of going through the panic. I'm like, I remember that. <laughs> yeah, like when I when I first read the book, I'm like, oh my god, this is horrifying. And then when I you know when I'm watching the show, I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Uh, Yvay. Um <laughs> Uh, I have a question for Tochi. Uh, why did you include reported pieces as part of Goliath's structure? Um, yeah, so so there are a couple reasons. The first is that I love reading nonfiction, um, and so probably one of the one of the nerdier things about me is when I like magazine subscriptions. <laughs> <laughs> I the London Review of Books, for instance, is like one of my favorite publications ever, and I read it religiously. And it's it's so it's like that and and like Harper's. I have a bit of a love hate relationship with, but like also like Vanity Fair pieces, all of that. Um, and so I I wanted to have. I think what's interesting about a lot of nonfiction is that. You know, particularly in reported pieces, it can you can you can come from thirty thousand feet in the air on a particular issue and dive down into the worm's eye view, and you can you know you can modulate the story however you need to in order to talk about the particular issue. You can have you can have a piece that's about an issue in a way that it's a little bit more difficult to do in a piece of fiction, where um oftentimes you need a character to you know ground the connection between the writer and reader um and so with an issue like you know or i guess with the sort of cornucopia of issues that that the book is that goliath is dealing with climate change gentrification colonization all of that stuff um i wanted to be able to to have that tool in the toolbox so to speak it was also really it was also a really fun um moment of ventriloquism like figuring out how to write like um you know like a middle class white journalist like <laughs> it's like it was it was just really fun for me um you know how do you how do you write like someone who you know whose work would appear in harper's or whose work would appear in the LRB. Um, that was a really fun exercise for me to do. Um, and it was also, you know, I think a, another book that does this sort of thing really interestingly is American War by Omar el Akkad, which I think came out 2017, 2016, 2017. Fantastic book about a second American Civil War. But in between the chapters are these uh, essentially documents. And so sometimes mm -hmm. they can be excerpts from a political memoir. Sometimes they're uh, redacted transcripts from somebody being held in Guantanamo, all sorts of things. And they do this incredible job of filling out the story there. It's I mean, it's it's a very neat and convenient way to world build as well. Um, so I think there, you know, those are a couple of the reasons why uh, I found it necessary to, to have those pieces and why they were, they were so much fun to write. Uh, we have, we have a question from uh, Carol Geisender for, for you, Tochi. 
Tor.com said Goliath was in the vein of Station Eleven. What similarities or differences do you see? We oh man, about. um yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, it's it's I mean it's been it's been interesting. I I I originally read Station Eleven, I want to say in 2015. Um, and so like it like I really I really appreciated it. I think one of the one of the differences, or I guess similarities first, you know, they both sort of deal with the aftermath of, you know, I guess you could say a world ending incident um, and how people cope. I think that's a theme that runs through both books. Um, I think one of the things in Station Eleven is that one of the answers to that question is art and the sort of power of art to, to sustain human connection, to carry people through trauma and through traumatic circumstances and what have you. It's art as a way to sort of unite people. And it does that, you know, Station Eleven explores that issue in, in very fas fascinating um, fashion and with a lot of incredible pathos. Whereas Goliath, um, I wanted to, I don't know, life sucks for the characters in Goliath. Like it really, really, really sucks. And I wanted to get into more of the sort of material reality of people that might not necessarily or may not necessarily have thought given their own personal experiences or found that there can be any sort of deliverance in art um, or that there can be any sort of, um, you know, relief from their situation. They have to locate hope elsewhere. And so I think that's another one of the, of the biggest differences between the two books is where is hope located for these characters? Um, and I think in, you know, in that way, you know, it's interesting, um, you know, somebody also in the comments shouted out um, how high we go in the dark. And I think it's really fascinating. I, you know, I don't want to I don't want to say that that there's any sort of like movement or anything going on, because like Sarah pointed out, like the, the publication timeline for books is such that like there's no such thing as a trend, really. Um, but uh, I think with a lot of these books now that are coming out, a lot of these stories that are coming out now that are exploring sort of um post cataclysm worlds it's been very interesting to see all the different ways in which in these stories like characters locate hope because there isn't one single answer to that and so i do hope that that can be a conversation that we're continuing to have um particularly given how it speaks to our present moment yeah i mean uh it's funny you talk about timing because I, I remember when the uh <laughs> you know, the Lord of the Rings trilogy came out and then, you know, the Two Towers movie, people are like, oh, it's 9-11 conspiracy. I'm like, did you realize when these books were written, <laughs> didn't you? Right? Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Um, so uh, if anyone has any, has any questions, please ask them in the live chat. Um, so we were just talking a little bit, Tochi, you mentioned about like art helping us get through periods of trauma. And, you know, I think, you know, let's be honest, like the, the, like this is a real traumatic time for everyone. It's been going on almost two years. Um, I'm sure everyone knows that someone who's um, suffered or, or, or even died from, from COVID and, um, you know, we're isolated, we're, we're separated from people we care about, we're separated from communities that we normally participate in, family. Um, how have you two been dealing with that artistically? Like, how has that affected your work? Has it influenced your work in any way? Has it um, increased your productivity, decreased your productivity, you know, had some kind of inspiration for you? Um, Sarah, you want to you want to start? Yeah, uh, right at the the the, the um, spring of 2020 was the most hectic thing that I had ever brought upon myself. It was, it was my own fault, but I had, um, I had accidentally decided that the three part-time jobs added up to one full-time time job. So, so I was, I was still working my, my half-time day job, um, which was normally pretty chill, but had, uh, I was trying to get some legislation passed. Um, and, and that was very, Time consuming, and I had also agreed to to um, teach a, a writing workshop uh, at, at a college, and I had novel edits due, 
and and those three things together were like six jobs and um and i was just frantic and 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 completely buried so uh, uh around june i you know the semester ended and it had gone online halfway through the semester and then uh, i I was downsized at the day job, which I was so glad for because I was never going to leave that job because I, I loved my uh, my coworkers um, and I loved my boss and and it was and it was a terrible organization to work for, um, all in all. But I was I really liked the people I was working with and the work I was doing, and I was just so stressed out and and that went away and I could just write and. And so everyone else was really stressed, and I was actually suddenly like, like right at the height of when everyone was, I think, feeling the most locked down. I, I felt this uh, overwhelming sense of freedom, mm -hmm. um, and you know, I I'm fortunate in that I can, you know, I was I was able to make that transition, and that um, I live in a, a neighborhood of Baltimore where I can just walk and walk the dog. And uh, so, so I've been able to write and walk the dog. And um, those are the things that have kept me happy and sane. Um, and, you know, it's, and, and then we adopted the puppy, which is a lot, but um, I miss music terribly. I miss live music more than, more than anything. And I miss playing it um, particularly, but uh I think I think I've been lucky and have you been able to like zoom do music zoom stuff? I mean like I see sometimes I'm I'm it's not I mean like I can I've gone to some shows there I think there's some people who have got the equipment to 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 do good stuff online and I've sort of left that to the to my friends who who need who need that for their living like I have friends who are who are doing like shows every Wednesday night online, and they've you know developed a a whole thing that they do, and it's great. And um, but I don't think it works for for uh, bands all that well unless you do something really high end. Um, I, I've played outside like during during better weather. I've played outside with with Karen Osborne a few times. She plays fiddle, um, so so we'll we'll go over to a bookstore and play in the yard, but. Um, yeah, it, I, I just miss miss playing with the full band and miss going to big shows that I'm not ready to go to right now. Tochi, what about you? Yeah, no, it's uh, you know I I experienced a lot of recognition listening to Sarah's answer um, because similarly and also just given my own personal constitution, um, I I appreciated being left alone to like do my thing and like to sit in and write. And, you know, I started writing full time uh, March, 2019. So by the time everything started locking down, I'd already had a year of this under my belt. So I knew, you know, how to cope or I had at least coping mechanisms and everything built in. And a lot of my, a lot of my worries and anxiety were, were geared more towards, you know, my loved ones and other people in my life, my family is filled with healthcare workers and they're on the front lines of things. But um, it became very clear very early on that they were also dealing with this, you know, with the most emotional intelligence out of anybody I knew. Like they were, you know, they're supremely competent at what they do. And so, you know, my worry wasn't, you know, helping them in any way, shape or form. And once I'd internalized that, a lot of things got um, much easier to, to deal with. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's been interesting in terms of the pandemic and, and art and whatnot. You know, I, I talked to all these, you know, like Hollywood producers or people in film and TV and for so much of last year and the tail end of 2020, everybody's like, oh, we need, you know, happy things. We need light things. You know, nobody wants that like super dark stuff, right? And then Squid Game dropped and everybody <laughs> after that was like, okay, we need our next Squid Game. <laughs> yeah. And so I think, you know, it was fascinating because it really, it really um, complicated the idea. I don't want to say it completely, you know, popped the bubble, but it really complicated the idea of what people are looking for um, in terms of art and entertainment during this time. I think it can be easy to say that, oh, it sucks outside. And so I'm going to do, I want to, I want, escape like indoors or whatever. Um, 
which would, you know, might make things a little bit difficult trying to sell Goliath. Um, but I think for a lot of people, it, can, it you know, it's a bit more complicated than that, or it can be a bit more complex than that. You know, people, I think early on in the pandemic, you know, Contagion, that movie by Steven Soderbergh was like one of the most watched movies on whatever streaming platform it was on. And it was like, if you're going through a pandemic, why would you watch a movie about people going through a pandemic, right? Yeah, um, but like, Tons of people, tons of people flock to that movie. And so I don't know, it's been it's been interesting as a as a consumer of art and entertainment to to find myself in that space and asking those questions and dealing with those 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 issues. Now, as a practitioner of art, <laughs> you know, as a as a sort of artist myself, it's been interesting because, you know, dark is my default. Like that's just like what I know how to do. Um it's what I like came up doing. It's the vast majority of the the entertainment and art that I imbibe. It's just the space that I'm most comfortable living in. But I was very fortunate in that uh, last year I was able to collaborate with the Smithsonian the Museum um, and I did these workshops. I was in these workshops with a bunch of these research institutes or you know research branches of the Smithsonian. Um, and I and another writer um, and futurist, uh, Madeline Ashby, we wrote these short stories um, that were paired with posters that were made by made and designed by Brian Miller, this incredible artist, to be part of the Smithsonian Futures exhibit that launched um, last December or this past December. And what was really meaningful to me about those workshops and the resulting stories was just the sheer optimism um, just like exuding from the people in these research institutes and the people that were conducting this this research and that were exploring these issues and these items and whatnot it's very easy i think to look around and see nothing but like decline and devastation and the world is burning the world is falling apart and everything but you know we these people who are like literally on the ground in all of this stuff you know could not help but exude this this sense of of hope and that made its way into the stories um those short stories that i wrote with the smithsonian are some of the most optimistic and uplifting things that i've ever written in my entire life and it did my spirit so much good to write those things um i felt like physiologically better mm -hmm. having generated those stories and so i'm hoping that you know it's a thing that i can you know it's an opportunity that i can either look into or or create for myself you know again um, given my current obligations and whatnot, but um, yeah, it's been it's been interesting operating in this time as as an artist. You do you remember any any specific uh, research topics that they were doing? I'm just curious, like what? what oh man, yeah, like uh, um, the. I, I wish I could remember the the exact name of the. I think it was the history of women in sciences. Um, there was one, there was one research institute that that was their ambit, and basically a lot of a lot of what they were up to was basically you know revising and filling out the historical record with regards to the contributions of of women and uh, queer people in science um, historically and. You know, I, I think that's another issue that it's really easy to look at and see, okay, like this is where it's, this is where things have gone wrong or this is where it's fucked up. This is where all these people have been left out. But then you get that, like, you're able to put a puzzle piece into place and that moment of, you know, it can almost feel like restitution or even like mm -hmm. reparation can be so fulfilling and so just like spirit enlarging. And so like seeing things like that, there's another, um, uh, natural sciences uh, research branch uh, that was talking about using mangroves as a way to combat um, land loss. And like that is, it's so brilliant. Like it's so, and it's, I don't know, it was so much of the stuff that they were doing was solutions oriented um, and in ways that didn't, that didn't involve necessarily being in an antagonistic relationship with the world around you, mm -hmm. um, which I think is like the really, was the really important thing that I got from that, no matter what the issue was that we were looking at, um, you know, redefining our relationship to it such that it isn't one of antagonism. Um, and that was really, that was really cool. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I really, I really like that. I, I think that, um, you know, 
especially if you if you spend a lot of time on social media, there is this tendency. Like social media obviously amplifies the emotional content, and and usually it's it's the negative, negative. stuff amplified. I, I can't watch the news negative, negative, online. Negative. And you know, I, I subscribe to a couple of different science magazines, and it's like there's a lot of really cool stuff that's happening, and like <laughs> it's going to take time, and it's slow, and it's it's not that interesting. I mean, it's it's very interesting to me, but it's not like exciting, like like emotionally. It's like. Yeah, we're actually doing research to to um, you know keep coral alive. Like there are certain species of coral that are more hardy against climate change that we might be able to save coral. And they're doing slow experiments, and you know the reefs may not die if this if this works. Mm -hmm. um, that's really cool, but you don't really hear that on social media, and you just get certainly that not in the news. Certainly, there's a lot of negative. I'm not trying to minimize the amount of negative shit that's going on. There's a ton of negative shit, but no, I, what I mean is you don't hear enough of the good news I'm not, it, yes it. right it's, it's so it's yeah i mean I, like like a, a prime example of that i think is the conversation surrounding bitcoin i'm agnostic on bitcoin i just don't know enough about it um to like have an opinion about it um but so much of the conversation surrounding bitcoin particularly online is like oh it's like you know this massive scam that's put out by all these like tech bros to like try to like whatever 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 um but then you read about or you look into how bitcoin is being used in developing economies and throughout developing countries where there isn't necessarily the most robust banking infrastructure right um, and this is how people are able to do things like like maintain their shop or build their shop or you know mm -hmm. buy whatever resources they need to sustain their livelihood or what have you and like that wouldn't have occurred to me to think about if my entire um if all the input that i got on this particular issue were from like you know the people that i follow on twitter so i i, I mean i'm actually very curious like sarah like what's been your experience like dealing with you know i don't know like the negativity particularly with regards to like art and entertainment for consumption and whatnot because i think there's a lot of there are a lot of opinions with regards to oh you shouldn't watch this movie or you shouldn't watch this tv or you shouldn't watch this this book so like how how have you like dealt with that because like I, I'm, I'm kind of taking yeah. notes <laughs> yeah that's an interesting question i've kind of pulled back from some of the online discourse on some of that stuff um i i tend to be of the opinion that i at least in regards to art that i don't need to put anything negative out there like like, like the in ter like in terms of talking about other people's art um I, I think that there are people who's, you know, I'm not a reviewer. I'm not a, um, I'm not an academic. I don't need to, to put down my peers, um, which is, which is kind of how I look at that stuff in general. Um, and then in terms of what to watch and what to, you know, and, and, and the way that people immediately start putting something down, if it's, if it brings others joy, like, like I've, you know, you've got to step back from it a little bit, like, like just like what you, and I think, yeah, it's interesting because we're more online than ever, uh, like, like, you know, but I, I feel like I've given myself more permission to like what I like lately and, you know, not look as much. I've, I've been trying to wean myself off of Goodreads too, which I like, <laughs> well, I don't like look which I, well, yeah, no, I, don't I don't look at, I don't look at my own stuff, but, but for a long time I was, I was still reviewing stuff, but, but it was my, you know, my like Pauline Kale style, like how this affected me, you know, I, I wasn't, mm -hmm. I wasn't, I'm not a reviewer again, like I'm not trying to do it for other people, but, but there it was out in public and, and you know other people can see it and, and I've, I've started pulling back and i went back to like writing a notebook for myself with just my own and, and it frees me up to say different things about the the stuff that i'm reading um in a way that really interests me because there's stuff that i would not say in a public forum that that i'm more willing to say to myself um for good and for bad because mm -hmm. um, you get judged on what you like you get judged on what you say you get um you know it, there, there's a lot of putting people down and I'm, I'm just not, not not wanting to be part of that right now. Well, it's really damaging. I mean, yeah. self to everybody. 
and yeah, I don't know. Like, like there's there's so much good stuff happening right now. There yeah. there is so much good. Like like uh, people are putting such good writing into the world. There you know there's yeah. there's great TV. There's great comics. There's great books. There's great stories, and and like we could just be shouting about the things we love. And I, I would just like to see more and more shouting about the things we love. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, like like the latest episodes of Attack on Titan. Oh my goodness! <laughs> oh my goodness! Sorry, don't even don't let me get started. I've I never got into that. Hijack this whole what is it? Black what, 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 what show is that? It's Attack on Titan. Um, it's this anime that's based on this manga, and it's in its final stretch of episodes. And oh, okay. chills, chills, <laughs> chills. Now, oh, correct it's... me if I'm wrong, but isn't that the one that has like a thousand episodes or something crazy? No, that's One Piece. That's you're thinking One Piece. Yeah, okay. One Piece had people have been. My brother has been trying to get me to watch One Piece for the longest time, and okay. it's got it's got a thousand plus episodes, and it's ongoing. Okay. And I'm like, yeah. life is too I, short, fam. Like I don't. <laughs> Well, yeah, exactly. on how many people recommend these things how to many... me all the time on Facebook. I'll say, okay, I watched this over the weekend, and I really liked it. I mean, just like a few lines about it, a movie or something, <coughs> a TV show I binge, and everyone gives other recommendations. I think, yeah, 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 maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll get to it, but I've got 50, 100 things on my Netflix queue. You know, I just want to watch oh, that. My you know, yeah. if I can't binge it, I don't want to watch it. I'm, I will not watch TV on, by the week anymore. As a kid, I did that. Well, that and, and, and it used to be that if you if you missed an episode, if you missed an episode, you just never saw that, that was episode. The TV. I was addicted as a kid growing up. I'm a boomer. I mean, my whole childhood was glued to the television. If I was out sick during the day. I would watch TV from 9 a.m. till my mom made me shut it off and go to sleep. And believe me, I, I don't know what it's like now, but at that time, the, first of all, there's nothing, no such thing as a talk show. But there was nothing on except crap. I mean, there were a lot of soap operas like in the mid afternoon. Yeah. There was all this, I mean, game shows in the afternoon. Oh, no, it's horrible. I mean, but I watched because I loved the television. You know? I have to, I have to say though, like, like when Lost was on. Um, mm. like I was working. I was working in an office when Lost was on, and literal, like the you know the water cooler yes. moment, like, like that was real. Like you got like like the episode would air, and the next day you would come in and you would pick apart every bit of it, and you would call the phone numbers that were on the, the screen, yeah. <laughs> and and you were all on the same episode. And I think that yeah. kind of matters. And I miss that. Like I miss the the all on the same episode, what, so what, that you what can. What was that? What was that? What decade was that? Uh, I think it ended in like 2011, oh, something yeah. around that. Yeah, I, stopped watching, I stopped watching television around nine, after I got out of college. So in the 19, <clears throat> 1970s, I stopped watching television except for Miami Vice. <laughs> that I, I feel like, I mean, <laughs> Miami <laughs> Vice is an like iconic the show. They look great. No, the, that, that cut, the style is terrific, the Miami Yeah, style. well. I think what's interesting, Sarah, about Lost is I, it strikes me as like the first like internet show or like the first like that's the first time that I remember people going on message boards online to like talk about a show and share theories and like all of that. Mm -hmm. I don't remember that being a thing before. Like I feel like yeah, there was communal viewing before, like who shot Jr. Like all of that. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of like that water cooler aspect that you're talking about, I feel like Lost was maybe one of the first shows that had that in the internet age and it's been it's been absolutely wild see because like what what disney plus show was it that they decided to do the episodes like once a week or whatever and there was all this uproar because people were like i'm not doing that like oh disney plus like they're ruining their whole like marvel is it mandalorian yeah wandavision yeah, yeah. yeah. WandaVision was the one that I remember there being all this uproar over because they decided to like air the episodes like, and, <laughs> like and, once a week. And WandaVision is the first one in years that I've I felt that thing where where like we were trying to figure out what was going on, what's going on with those weird commercials, like the interstitial yes. things, and like it, like is it a you know is it a pocket universe? Is it this? Is it that? Is it um, you know it, like we were it, it was that same thing again where you can be excited and be on the same at the same point mm -hmm. as other people and have something to share. Um, which which I think, I guess book clubs are, I've seen a lot of people in the last couple of years like doing book clubs and it always seems to be um, 
<laughs> the puppy's oh, back. No. Uh, it always seems to be Moby Dick. Like, like we're. Uh, I've seen like <laughs> one after another reading Moby Dick chapter by chapter, like like one chapter a week type of deal. Um, mm -hmm. And and but that idea of like being in the same place um, is is really interesting to me. This is Zimmy. He's eight months old. He's oh, past Zimmy. his bedtime. <laughs> Little Zim. I had that experience watching Mr. Robot where like after every episode, I would immediately go on to Reddit and they would actually have, just have a specific thread just for that. Yep. And would have their theories about what was going on. And it was really fun. And if like people who rewatch the show, they go back and they, they come, it's the, the actual, the, uh, the Reddit forum for Mr. Robot still going strong for people who are just watching it for the first time. Uh, mm. If you want an intense show that, 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 you know, keeps you on your seat every episode. I definitely recommend that. Um, so I, one of my uh, favorite podcasts that I listen to is Functional Nerds. I don't know if you're familiar with that one. I've been listening to it for a while. And they, they do this thing where it's like picks of the week, where basically they ask the guests, like, what, what do you recommend? Like, it could be anything. It could be, you know, media, or whatever, music. Um, so I, I'm going to ask you both. Um, what what do you recommend? Could be anything. It's something you're watching, reading, listening to, some food you had. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just described the food I had that I fell in love that I like. Okay. Next, my face in before we got on live. <clears throat> I'm not repeating it. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe I will after you guys say yours. <laughs> um. This is a, uh, I've been on Functional Nerds and they asked that question ahead of time. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I think my answer was ice cream. So I'll stand by my answer of, yeah, I'll stand by my answer of, um, uh, I, I am a fan in any season of really good ice cream. Um, mm -hmm. And we have really, really good ice cream around here. Um, okay. And and they keep they keep upping their game with new flavors and the, the mm -hmm. yeah. Um, Sounds like heaven. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm a, I'm a big ice cream fan. Um, the 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 local one that I think is shipping now that I would recommend is Taharka Brothers. Mm. Um, they're they're worker owned and they uh, they they make like the of any flavor I can think of that they make they they make the best version of it. So they're like their mint mm. their mint one is called Mint Flicks and Chill, and it's got like hunks of peppermint patties in it, mm. and like it's the best mint chocolate chip ice cream or like mint whatever ice cream that I've ever had. And then they're like key lime pie is the best key lime pie. And they're like every flavor and even the flavors that you think you won't like so much, like, like graham, like honey graham ice cream, like whatever, like it's the best thing you could think of. Like, like they just one flavor after another, they just do it perfectly. So, so to Tar brothers ice cream will be my answer. Okay. Wow. Um, <laughs> wow. Now so, I want to so I know, right? So I, I don't even know if this is a recommendation so much as this is me just shouting about a thing that I saw that I loved recently. Um, it's it's uh, Zola, the movie um, that came out in 2020. It's this um, it's like black comedy crime movie. Um, it's written by uh, Jeremy O'Harris, who did Slave Play, and uh, Janisa Bravo, and directed by Janisa Bravo. And so basically, the backstory behind... <laughs> The backstory behind this is that I think it was, I want to say October 2015, there was this, there was this Twitter thread. And this was before Twitter like had the functionality to do threads. So it was just literally like a series of 100 plus tweets in a row. I think it was like 120 um, or 130 or whatever, like thereabouts. Um, but basically, basically, it was about, it was, it was a number of tweets from this dancer talking about this absolutely wild and like literally unbelievable episode that she had in Florida that happened because she like befriended uh, this white chick who like showed up at the Hooters that she worked at. And it's it's got this super iconic um, like first line that like I can't, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna repeat um, per se, but you you're you're reading through this, 
this thread and you're seeing all the things that are happening and all the different escalations and the whole time you're like this this can't possibly be real and just when you think it's gotten at its like wildest stage it gets even wilder and like it's almost like absurdist how just all over the place and bonkers it is um but speaking of communal moments i remember where i was when i first read the zola thread like i was i remember i was at i was working in the civil rights bureau of the new york state attorney general's office and I remember I was in my office and I had the window behind me. We were on, we're on Broadway downtown in Fidei at the time. I think where the where the tour offices are now. Um, but uh, that original thread, I remember that day, and I think I'd seen it like the day after it posted, that like afternoon, everybody that I knew was at their computers reading this thread and we were all like G chatting or emailing each other like, yo, have you seen this? Yo, have you, have you seen this? Yo, you have to read this right now. Yo, have you like everybody that I knew, everybody that I knew at the same time, at the same like set of hours that day, we were reading that epic, epic Zola thread. And so A24 made a movie out of it um, that I think it's streaming on Showtime. That might've been what most recently saw, but um that i it in it's i've seen a lot of poorly done like internet on tv or internet in film like it's just not done really well even even things like people texting on tv or in film like it's still sort of rudimentary but Zola felt like the first like internet movie that i ever saw and not like about people in the internet but it's just like the internet is just like the the ecosystem in which this thing happens and like this couldn't have happened this story couldn't have been told without the internet i don't know i'm not making a lot of sense but like i just it was incredible seeing and what's wonderful about it too is this this dancer um is an executive producer on it so it wasn't just that she told this viral story, maybe arguably the first viral thread in Twitter history that got picked up as a nonfiction story in Rolling Stone. And then it got made into a movie that made a, a bunch of dollars or whatever, and she didn't benefit. No, she was she was an EP on this. So that I think is like the cherry on top. Um, but yeah, man, that, that movie was wild. And the soundtrack totally brought me back to like mid 2010s. Oh my goodness. It was amazing. It, it made me so happy. It made me so happy. And if you're a fan of succession, the guy who plays Greg, the egg is, uh, you know, has a very, has a very important role in Zola. So that's why. Greg, Greg that's my succession, pick. man. Just yeah. like, what are you doing, man? I um, know. I'll, give a, I'll give a, I'll give a quick rec. Uh, some of you probably have seen it. It's called uh, The Clove Hitch Killer that my wife and I just watched a couple nights ago. Um, it is the story of um, a small, I think it's a town in Maryland. I don't want to say too much, but it's about a serial killer and it's about a kid who, and uh, two kids who decide to investigate the serial killer themselves. And it is a, a lot of surprises. I, if I say any more, I will spoil it but it's it's quite good and it's it's very intense um where is it i mean how can we I see it i think it was on netflix. it was on netflix my mm -hmm. wife's is netflix um yes called the clove hitch killer it was it was very very intense and good um, and I raved, before we started i raved about my favorite thing <laughs> that's um the lobster tail pastry <laughs> from veneros <laughs> yeah that's filled with whipped cream. If Teresa you can get to New York City. Is. Yeah. It's shaped like a lobster tail. It's got crunchy layers of pastry. And inside it's filled with whipped cream. And it's the most de devilish, delightful dessert <laughs> I have had in a long time. It was, you know, it's totally self-indulgent. Um, that, that is in it, the... Is it in the chat that in Italian? I didn't know that. Okay. Foglia Deli. Um, in, in the chat. Oh, I know it's called Lobster Tail. I mean, the guy oh, knew what I was talking about. How do you pronounce this? Sfoglia Deli. Sfoglia Deli. Yeah. Sfoglia Deli. We should we should ask we should ask Jared Leto. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> 
in the chat the the movie searching is also mentioned that was that was a really good um yeah that that was a cool movie it was with uh, john john cho and it was uh uh like all of the i think the entire movie was like, like there was no part of the movie that wasn't through a a social media lens at some point like, like so it was like through through chats like, like the whole movie was told either it's a search for his daughter and um the whole movie's told through chats and through uh like uh computer cameras and through uh searches and and uh maps and everything it's it's really interesting there was a I saw a trailer for a, a new series. I think it was Netflix. It was called like Archive something or other, and it was basically. Oh, is like it Archive eighty one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've heard of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It looked it looked interesting. It was like someone was hired to recover um, found media from a fire, and apparently, like the building was haunted that burned down, and then the he slowly uncovers some supernatural stuff. It it looked pretty interesting. Um, it's hard to tell from the trailer, but you know, I love found footage. I love like the interstitial stuff, like when you when you've got in Goliath and uh, and and all of the just anything like that where there's like some sort of puzzle to figure out, like how these pieces fit together. Um, I, like I eat all of that up. Even um, there was that book that was uh, sort of conceived by J.J. Abrams, and he gave it to a writer to to do a few years ago. It was it was called S, um, and it was. It was a book within, a, like, like the whole thing was was sort of an old school novel, and then there were these two like researchers writing to each other in the in the um, in the in the margins, and then there was also something else that was going on in the footnotes, and then there were a whole bunch of like uh, things that came in the book, like napkins with maps on them. And, and, and the whole thing is just like one big puzzle. And, and it's the same thing as lost. And it's the same things we've been talking about. And I've heard yellow jackets also has that, but I'm a little afraid to watch it. Cause I've heard that there are animals getting killed and, um, I'm not good at animal horror. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, all of those, like I recommend all of those. <laughs> what, what you were describing reminds me a lot about a, a lot of, um, house of leaves. Um, mm -hmm, that too yeah oh my goodness i remember i remember i like this must have been like 2011 or something i you know i remember being i regularly had to commute on on metro north and so i'd be on this train and be hunched over this book that's like upside down and i'm turning it every which way to read it and i can't even imagine how other people are looking at me like yo what is wrong with this dude? he's holding the book the wrong way etc cetera, etc cetera. but yeah no i really i i mean i like i like exactly what you're talking about sarah with regards to working to make connections between things i mean one of the touchstones for me with regards to goliath was um 2666 by roberto bolaño mm -hmm. um it's i mean it's what's wild about that book is that you you have all these sections that are sort of disparate and tell their own stories, but the very but they're like the links between them are so elliptical. And sometimes the only real link is that they it, all this stuff exists between you know the same set of covers. And so there has to be a reason behind that, right? Like, why is this search for this scholar connected to this just like absolutely monstrous and deadening like catalog of femicide in this fictional Mex Mexican town. What like what what connects all these things? And so the idea of of making the reader like I think one of the reasons I like the idea of drafting the reader in the enterprise of making those connections is that oftentimes the answers will be different for each reader. Um, mm -hmm. And there may be some like overlap in answers and whatnot, but it's still an individual experience for each reader that has to go through that thing. Um, and so the answers that people will come up with for why this thing is in this same book as this thing could be wildly different and incredible. I don't know. I, I, I just love having those conversations. I think, and I think part of it is, is trust in the reader and trust in the viewer. And I don't think we get enough of that. Like I think a lot yes. of, a lot of creators, um, especially in the in the realm of things that are 
like, with corporate owners, you know, like, like, like mm-hmm. the things that, and the things that have a lot of money invested in them, they want to make sure that everyone is happy, but, but there's, there's also this level where if you can involve them in it and, yes. and like, and get them, get them interested on that level where, where they feel um, trusted and part of the, the question, part of the mystery, like, like, the, yeah, yeah, I think that that's the thing that I'm like most obsessed with right now in terms of if you can invite the reader in and 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 get them to figure out the the like, like yeah puzzles and puzzles in fiction. I love puzzles in in fiction in any uh, media. Yeah, if you take them to the finish line or or you lead them there, but you don't cross it, you let the reader cross it themselves. They will love you for it. <laughs> I have a story that came out this year that's uh, um, it's it's in Uncanny, but it's a, a story told in song lyrics, and then the the people discussing the song lyrics on a on a website, um, and and that that was that was my attempt to do that thing where where there are all these people trying to solve something, but then you have to get the reader to make the next leap also. Uh, hmm. Um, so we're coming up on nine o'clock. So I think we should probably wrap it up soon unless we have more questions. Karen, um, I love whipped cream and that's what makes it for me. <laughs> lobster tail. But anyway. Yeah. So apparently the lobster tail and the is not, not the same, the same thing. thing. They the aren't the same thing. thing. Yes. We've had our experts weigh in and <laughs> Google, Google weighed in. Google weighed in. Um, well, you've been listening to Fantastic Fiction at KGB. Um, thank you so much to Tochi Anyabuchi and Sarah Pinsker for joining us this yes. evening. This and was uh, really, 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 really great. Um, I wish we could have hung out in person, but we, uh, you we know, will. totally thank appreciate you. that that uh, you were able to do it virtually. And we uh, thanks to everyone who joined us for the the live show and who's watching this. Uh, recorded on youtube um yeah you guys are you guys are awesome so uh thanks Sarah, for having you, us yeah, yeah thank you for having us of course thanks to everyone who came yeah so stick around uh, we're gonna hang out in the green room after we uh, end the live broadcast but uh thanks everyone and uh we'll uh we'll see you next week next month next month, next month. <laughs> <laughs> yeah all right good night everybody good night